This episode of the Art of Manliness podcast is brought to you by Cricket Shirts. So the guys at Cricket have come out with their take on the old school chamois shirt. It's the shirt that it's really great to wear when you're out camping, when you're out in the outdoors because it's thick, it's warm, it's soft. They're calling in their version the JR shirt inspired by J.R. Ewing from Dallas. What they've done is they've taken this old school functional piece of clothing and given it the cricket touch. Much more tailored fit, so it's not big and boxy and bulky looking on you. Great looking colors, and they've got the one pocket like they do on their players polo shirts. So if you're a fan of the cricket shirts, the players polo, the long sleeve shirts, the JR shirt is a great addition to your wardrobe. You can wear it to the office, but if when you're out camping, you can take it as well and it'll keep you nice and warm and toasty. If you want 20% off and free shipping, got a deal for you. Go to Cricket Shirts, that's C-R-I-Q-U-E-T-S-H-I-R-T-S dot com and use coupon code Art of Man at checkout for 20% off and free shipping. Again, Cricket Shirts, coupon code Art of Man for 20% off and free shipping. Also by Carnivore Club. All right, Christmas is just right around the corner. If you're looking for a last minute gift idea, why don't you give the gift of meat? Well, you can do that with Carnivore Club. It's a monthly subscription service where they deliver an assortment of cured meats made by America's best artisans to your door. You can sign someone up for a one month to 12 months, and each month they're going to get a different box of cured meats made from things like duck, venison, and wild boar. If you want to get $10 off your gift subscription, go to carnivoreclub.co and enter promo code AOM at checkout. Again, carnivoreclub.co, promo code AOM at checkout. Brett McKay here, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. So if you read Band of Brothers, or at least in the miniseries, you are probably familiar with the name Major Dick Winters. He was a member of the Band of Brothers, Easy E Company, part of the Airborne Division that dropped in on Normandy on D-Day, was there at the Battle of the Bulge that captured Hitler's eagle's nest at the end of the end of the war. All the Band of Brothers, we've written about several of them on the site before, all of them had something that set them apart from each other, right? They all had their unique talents. With Dick Winters, the thing that probably set him apart from the other men in his company was his leadership ability. He displayed phenomenal leadership. Today on the podcast, we're going to talk to someone who had a, a close friendship with Dick Winters in the latter part of his years helped Dick write his personal memoirs of his wartime experience after the Band of Brothers series was released. And his name is Colonel Kingseed. He is a uh, retired colonel from the army and he helped write Dick Winter's uh, memoirs. But after Dick Winters died a few years ago, Colonel Kingseed wrote a, a book, put, about a, put out a book called Conversations with Major Dick Winters, just highlighting some of the conversations that he had with Dick about leadership, about character, about courage, about family, about friendship, about old age, and just all these life lessons. So in, it was this book actually was a big source in our article we did a few, a few months ago called The Way of the Monastic Warrior, Lessons from Dick Winters. So I had to get him on to talk about it. Great conversation, a lot of practical takeaways on how to be a better man in all aspects of your life, your physical fitness, courage, your character, your leadership. So without further ado, Colonel Cole Kingseed and conversations with Major Dick Winters. Okay, well, Dick Winters was the commander of an elite airborne company in World War II. That company was Easy Company, 2nd Battalion, 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment. Easy Company was the uh, subject of Stephen Ambrose's best-selling book called Band of Brothers. And this uh, Band of Brothers later became um, an HBO miniseries, a uh, ten-part miniseries on World War II. Yeah, and it's one of my favorite miniseries, and I know a lot of people uh, love that 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 miniseries, that series of movies. Um, before we get to more about your relationship with with Dick Winters, because it's fantastic, it's the subject of your book, Conversations with Dick Winters. Um, let's talk about more about his actual involvement, uh, specific actions he took or battles he was a part of as a commander in uh, of Easy Company. Well, he became the uh, commander of Easy Company on D-Day. Uh, the company commander of Easy Company was shot down uh, on a night, uh, a night drop, and Dick was the second in command. So he fought on D-Day, 
uh, 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 another uh, week later, uh, staying in Normandy, they fought at the Battle of Carentan, and they also uh, uh, participated in what's a, um, another airborne jump in Holland. And, um, and then, of course, the most significant battle that Dick fought was in the Battle of the Bulge, where the 101st Airborne Company was surrounded by several German um, divisions. And at war's end, uh, Dick's company was uh, responsible for the capture of Hitler's uh, eagle's nest at Berchtesgaden. And that's all uh, documented in the book, and you can see that as well in the, the film or the series, Brand, Band of Brothers. Um, I'm curious, how did you meet Major Winters? Uh, did you know who he was before you met him, or how did that happen? No, no, very, very interesting. Uh, before I retired from the Army in uh, 2001, I was the chief of military history at the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York during that time happened to coincide with the 50th anniversary of World War II. And what I used to encourage my officers is to invite these veterans of World War II to talk to the cadets at West Point. And I had one of my officers in um, 1998 who came to my office and uh, told me that he had invited Major Dick Winters, a band of brothers, to speak to the cadets. I had never heard of Dick Winters at that time. I had read uh, Band of Brothers, but it had been years before, and the name just didn't register for me. So what happened is uh, uh, this officer invited me to join uh, Major Winters uh, for dinner, and it's the only time I've ever pulled rank with one of my other officers. And I told him, I said, no, I, would, uh, I, I will gladly take that invitation, but I wanted it just to be just the two of us. And that's really how, again, and, uh, and our friendship evolved from that initial dinner meeting at the Hotel Thayer right there at the United States Military Academy at West Point. And we'll talk more about this friendship because it's, a, one, of, uh, it's, a, it's a, one of the beautiful parts of the book, uh, Conversation with Dick Winters. But this, that initial meeting led to you helping him uh, write his own memoirs of the war after the Band of Brothers book came out. Well, no, not yet. Uh, you know what? I don't think Dick was even thinking about doing his uh, memoirs, at, you know, at the time. What really uh, got Dick thinking about writing his memoirs, I remember we're talking about um, 1998. What, it, uh, what really kind of uh, encouraged him to do that is when the miniseries uh, came out, Spielberg and Hanks, um, when that miniseries aired, and that was in September of 2001, and I think it was really uh, as a result of that, the miniseries focused on Easy Company, the company that Dick commanded in World War II. But Dick then decided that he wanted to share his memories as of the leader of a daily company. And so Dick didn't even uh, contemplate writing his memoirs until Thanksgiving of 2003. Okay. Um, let's talk a bit about his, because he was one of the things that set Dick Winters apart from other soldiers. And all these, all the men who fought in World War II are fantastic. The Band of Brothers, amazing. But he was set apart as he had just displayed incredible leadership ability. Um, when did Winters begin? And this is something I always forget too. When you're, you read about these about Dick Winters, you watch the show on on TV. So these were young guys. He was 26 years old at the time, but he was displaying just phenomenal leadership. Something you'd expect from a 30 year old, a 40 year old, who's a you know seasoned veteran. When did uh, Major Winters start displaying his leadership ability? Was it at training camp, or was it something he nurtured along the way? Well, it's a, you know, it's very interesting, Brett. It's the, when you mentioned 26 years old, he was 26 years old at D-Day. But when he uh, joined the Army, I mean, he was, uh, he, he was on, he was just 23. The Dick Winters that you see in the Band of Brothers miniseries, uh, the, the seasoned, um, Dick Winters, I, you know, he, you know, he, he often reflected upon a couple things in his, uh, in his youth when he was in elementary school and all that. But, I, but I really think that Dick's, um, really refinement of leadership 
really came when he became a member of Easy Company, and by this time he has he was a second lieutenant, so he was a commissioned officer. That's the one. So we're talking about 1942, right when he joined uh, that this airborne unit. Uh, the, I, I think it was the mantle of command that provided uh, Dick Winters the courage to succeed and to be uh, a leader. And I thought it was interesting, and he, he made mention this throughout several points throughout in the book, in your conversations with him, he, he pushed himself really hard during airborne training, you know, the physical training aspect. Why did he think, and he, the reason he said he did that, because he said that physical fitness was an important part of leadership. Why did he think physical fitness was an important aspect of being a good leader? Well, part of it is remember remember the unit to which he was a part, uh, Easy Company, which is an airborne company. Airborne paratroopers have to have the ability to fight and to think on on their own because they're often uh, very isolated. What Dick would end up saying was simply this: Easy Company airborne training made me. It brought out the very best of uh, of me. Uh, he. He wanted to be part of the the best. He knew that men's lives were going to be, uh, you know, kind of based on the decisions uh, that he made. So he he, he was always a he was a great athlete, uh, uh, very physically fit. And what he ended up saying in times of crisis, a leader has got to be mentally tough. And he says mentally tough has its foundation on physical toughness. And that's why he ended up doing that. Uh, and, and that's why, I mean, he was uh, in, in his quiet time. Uh, he would he was a very reflective leader, but he, uh, he it allowed him when he was running, um, that gave him time for the personal reflection. And he knew that he needed that when the time would come for combat. We're going to take a quick break for your word from our sponsors. All right, the good folks at Montenbeau have released a new gene. It's called the Norfolk. It is a raw denim gene. And if you know anything about raw denim, most genes you buy have been – they're made with denim that have been treated in a way that make them more comfortable and they look uniform, have different type of fading on and whatnot. With raw denim, there's none of that. The way you – your body shape, the way you wear your jeans, how often you wash them will affect the fading and stressing of the gene and how it looks. So your jeans are going to be unique just to you. It's a lot of fun. People get really into it. So if you want to try raw denim – but the problem with raw denim, it can be really expensive to get this sort of gene. 100 bucks or less at Mott & Bow, so go check it out the Norfolk. And as always with Mott & Bow, you can take advantage of their try-on program. If you're not sure about your waist size, order two pairs of different sizes. Keep the one that fits you perfectly, and you can send the other one back completely for free. So if you want to try this out, go to mottandbow.com. That's M-O-T-T-A-N-D-B-O-W.com, and use promo code ARTOFMAN at checkout, all one word, for 20% off. Also by Creative Live. Creative Live helps people unlock their creative potential. They have online classes and seminars taught by some of the most knowledgeable people in the creative industry. So you can take classes and courses on design, computer programming, marketing, personal finance, all sorts of stuff. I've done the courses with Ramit Sadie, also Ryan Holiday uh, on marketing. So if you are in a business in the world of marketing, really useful class. A lot of other courses taught on there. So if you want to try it out, and it's going to be a great Christmas gift as well. If you know someone who is an entrepreneur type, a creative type, Creative Live would be a great gift for them. If you want to get 20% off any of Creative Live's classes, go to creativelive.com slash artofman for 20% off. Again, that's creativelive.com slash artofman for 20% off any of Creative Live's classes. Actually, your book's inspired a post that we did called The Way of the Monastic Warrior, uh, taking lessons from from Dick Winters on leadership. But before we get there, let's talk about how did Major Winters define leadership? Did he think it was something that was innate in men? Um, or was it just a matter of being put in the position and like you rose to the challenge? Or did he have a systematic way of developing it in himself and the men that he led? Uh, Dick always told me this. He, say, he says leadership itself is very difficult to define. He often quoted General Eisenhower. Eisenhower said this, the one quality that can be developed by studious reflection and practice is the leadership of men. 
Uh, I, uh, they had a tough time uh, defining leadership other than that. But it was very easy for him to define a leader. And he said that a, a leader is a, is a person who has not only the ability but the willingness to achieve exceptional results through people. And that's really kind of how he focused on leadership. Are leaders born or made? Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it is, uh, you, I think Dick would argue that uh, he was given certain um, innate qualities, but the leadership that Dick Winters became really was really based, as Eisenhower said, it was an evolving process based on the studious reflection and practice. Okay. Um, one thing I was interested in you, you highlight in, in both books were the the daily practices and habits that he continued even in the midst of battle uh, to, I guess, instill self-discipline in himself to be a great leader. Can you talk about some of those habits and daily practices that he, he kept going? Even, he kept going even during the Battle of Bulge, he was doing these things to, to maintain his ability to lead. Well, what he would end up doing, uh, you know, uh, prior to D-Day, he would always get up in the morning. Uh, he, he was staying um, away from the men, very similar to what you discussed in your uh, on that excellent article. Uh, uh, he lived a ways, and I know we'll talk about this, uh, uh, lived a, uh, a life apart uh, from his men. Uh, but both in the morning and in the evening, he would always take uh, a two- to three-mile run whenever possible. During the war, but what he would end up doing, he would still uh, get up in the morning. He, the very first thing he would uh, do, he would always shave. But most times you don't, infantrymen in war don't shave. And for Dick, it was also part of the, uh, that self-discipline that he thought was absolutely uh, required. He would still end up doing his push-ups, his sit-ups, and whenever possible, he would go on a, uh, on a run or, um, or a walk just to maintain his physical fitness. Well, that's amazing that he even did that during during battle. And let's talk a bit about the the solitude aspect. I mean, during the you get the picture you paint in the book, conversation with Dick Winters, is that he didn't have too many close friends during the war, and not too many after the war until later in life. Um, but that was a part. I mean, it seemed like it was a part of his plan or strategy to be an effective leader? How did his solitude or keeping apart from the group help him maintain his ability to be an effective leader? Well, he needed, he, he felt the, uh, the, the loneliness had, it was all part of his, uh, give him time to personally reflect. What Dick told me many times, and I think that maybe this is what kind of brought us uh, together. We used to chuckle about this. He said, I like to count my close friends on one hand. But now here's the other thing that, you, uh, that is so uh, relevant, and that is this. He goes, I don't want anyone to know me. And, what he, and, the, and what was, the reason he, he felt that way, he said, if he had personal relationships, that would cloud his judgment when times were uh, tough. And he, he didn't want to end up doing it. He wanted his uh, mind to be focused on the job at hand. And he said, if, if I develop too many friends or personal friends, even outside the unit, that that would cloud his judgment. And that would, uh, and he wanted to stay focused because he clearly understood that the lives of those paratroopers were based on decisions that he were, was going to make. But this isn't to say that uh, he was like really ice cold and aloof. He, he displayed great leadership. He, he balanced it with a bit of warmth, but with distance, I guess it would be the best way to describe it. Yeah, you know what, Brett? That's exactly right. And in the in the um, in, in, in the book uh, on the um, on his memoirs, Beyond Band of Brothers, um, he 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 gives you a, a wonderful balance prior to D Day. He said it's the, and he's writing to a platonic friend, and we can talk about that later on if you desire. And he says, I want you to picture, it is the spring in England. This is the uh, couple months prior to the day. And uh, an easy company is out maneuvers in the English uh, countryside. It is wet. He said it's always raining in uh, England in the spring. And I want you to picture a paratrooper 
in a foxhole, uh, cold and wet, and he looks off to the east, and he sees a figure approaching him. And now Dick Wright, uh, he kind of says, it's me, because I'm the only officer that out that early in the morning. And I said, I go down, I go down on one knee, and I ask the soldier how he's doing. And the uh, soldier, paratrooper, uh, is shivering, and he takes a, a picture of his girlfriend from his helmet, and he says up to Lieutenant Winters at this time, this is prior to D-Day, I want you to promise me that I will get a chance to see my girlfriend again. Well, Dick can't do that, but what he does do, what he does do is he tells him, I will do everything within my power to ensure that you get a chance to see him. The secret of Dick Winter's leadership, the, the loneliness, is, is simply this, Brett. Dick uh, began the war as an enlisted soldier, and he never forgot where he came from. Dick used to refer to himself as a half-breed. That was his words. An officer, yes, but an enlisted paratrooper at heart. And that balance is really what propelled him uh, to the, uh, through the war. One thing Major, List, Major Winters listed as an important aspect of becoming a good leader is the development of character. Can you tell us a bit about the character of Major Winters? Well, he was, uh, you know what, Brad? He was a very complicated man. He was very difficult to know. Once you got, once he, he allowed you into his inner circle, you could uh, discern the essence of uh, of Dick Winters. He thought that character was really the very foundation of leadership. Character revolves uh, around doing the right thing all the time. Character implies really daily choices and right over wrong. I would I would say this, and, and what Dick would talk about character, and because he always talked about character in war. He says, war doesn't alter character. War merely brings out the best that an individual has to offer. And uh, the Dick Winters that I knew uh, in the very latter stages of his life, that was the same Dick Winters that the public knew who watched Band of Brothers. He, it, it never changes. That's because, he felt, because, as I said, Dick was clearly, uh, he was cognizant of his, uh, of his role as a result of the publicity of Band of Brothers. And uh, he, he, his character never changed. He says, you know, uh, war brings out uh, sometimes the best and also, it, you know, and the worst in men. Uh, and Dick Winters have brought out the very best. Yeah, and you, you mentioned some actions that are just kind of, it, I think, um, reflect reflected his character in, in, in spades was even like after the war, he, he went to the IRS to like pay back taxes while he was gone. Like and he didn't have to do that, but he, he said he wanted to do it anyways. In fact, in, in fact, when he, when he went there to the, um, the postmaster said, you do not have to end up doing it. And he says, yes, I do have to do it because I have an obligation to, uh, you know, pay the taxes. That tells me a lot about Dick Winter's character. As I said, it was the uh, it revolves around doing the right thing all the time, not just when someone's uh, looking at you. Yeah. So what I mean? What lessons can men today take from Major Winters on developing a, a solid character like he had? Well, I you know I think it, it's the uh, I think the best uh, I think his greatest legacy is, is simply is you, uh, is to be true to yourself. Uh, never compromise your integrity. And if you can look in yourself at the uh, mayor at the end of the day and say you've done a good job, um, everything else will be okay. okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so here's another aspect of his character that I thought was interesting because oftentimes we think of soldiers out at war, they start, they carouse, they sort of let loose, they let, let go of their morals, it's battles, you know, what happens in war stays in war. But while he was preparing for the invasion of Normandy, rather than going out of the town to, with all the men in his unit to paint the town red, uh, Winters preferred to stay home and have quiet evenings with this English family um, with which he was lodging. Um, 
I mean, and then I thought it was interesting too. You talk about in the book that in the original Band of Brothers miniseries, they had him swearing and sort of being like a typical soldier. What did Dick Winters do in response when he first saw that or heard about the the, the, the amount of swearing that was happening in the movie? Well, uh, uh, Tom Hanks had called him, and they, and uh, Dick Winters and uh, Tom Hanks were very uh, uh, dear friends. Uh, through that, and uh, after the production had been finished, as far as filming, uh, before it was viewed by the public, Tom Hanks called Dick Winters, and he says, what do you think about it? And uh, Dick responded and says, I don't like it, Tom. The man that you you have figured uh, portraying me, Damian Lewis, is cursing and swearing and is very profane, and you know that I'm not like that. And I don't want some young boy or girl to watch that and think that that's the type of character that I am. So, and, and then Dick then followed up and says, I want you to change it. And uh, to his credit, Tom Hanks uh, called the studio in London and said, Dick's displeased with it, and I want, want that to be changed. And, Dick, and then Dick said, that's what it is. That's what I'm talking about, that his character never changes. Even with all the publicity and everything, he, he was always true to himself. And he wanted to make sure that, uh, that he was setting the proper example. Uh, for, and that's, and I think that's part of his great uh, legacy. Just wanting to be an example all the time. All the time. And that's what I'm saying. It, it's the uh, character implies daily choices of right over wrong. Okay. So we talked a little bit about this, um, touched on it a bit, but I want to go more into detail because he, he talks about it in, in, at length in the book. Um, and that is one of the hardest things about being a leader, whether you're in the military or in a business, is keeping morale up amongst the, those you lead. And it, it's doubly difficult during battle, but Major Winters was able to do this. How did he keep? How was he able to keep morale up even during the Battle of the Bulls when there was just it was freezing cold, constant shelling? What did he do to keep morale up amongst his troops? Well, he was uh, again. Uh, he goes back to being uh, uh, true to himself. Dick Winters. Uh, one of the reasons why he became such an effective leader, and that even during the Battle of Bulls, the individual paratroopers in Easy Company would always say, long after the war, the best leader they ever met was. Captain or Major Winters, whatever he happened to be. And the thing is simply this. Dick Winters um, led through example rather than um, by rank um, or by fear. He always led by example. And what Dick would end up doing uh, during the Battle of the Bulge, uh, uh, and uh, Stephen Ambrose, the author who uh, wrote Band of Brothers, said this. Uh, you know, three or four, uh, three or four days uh, under artillery bombardment is hell. A week is worse than hell. And what Dick would end up doing, he said, you have to know your soldiers so well that you can detect when they are about ready to uh, crack under pressure. And then, then you have to pull them off the line. And, but you, you need to not understand what are the symptoms or what are, uh, you know, the, when a soldier has had enough. And I asked Dick about this. And I, it, it, the first time I asked Dick about that, I said, you know what, gosh darn it, why didn't you crack under pressure? Now, the very first time, before I knew him too well, he said, well, I'm Pennsylvania Dutch. I don't <laughs> break. Well, okay. And I, there are a lot of soldiers who did break. Later on, when I got to know him a little bit better, he says, you understand, you have to understand that the Battle of Bulge, uh, my command post was only 75 yards from the front line. Now, you might not think that 75 yards is uh, much distance, but it, it's a tremendous amount of difference because you don't have uh, the individual uh, observation from the enemy to where you are. So you need to then have to get up, get around, talk to the soldiers, just to convince them uh, that things are going to be uh, all right, all, you know, all right. He said, and a lot of times he demonstrates courage. 
He said, listen, everybody is, 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 uh, is fearful in war. He says, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the willingness to rise above fear and to do the things that you know need to be accomplished. And that's what he was doing. And he had to do, he had the command presence and his willingness to share the hardships with the men that, uh, that, and that, that's what inspired him. We led from the front. Always led, uh, uh, he led from the front. Um, let's go back to the friendship. I can understand why keeping a distance uh, from his soldiers would help him be an effective leader. Um, but you mentioned his platonic pen pal. So this is a, a gal that he, he met before going over to Europe and they were writing each other letters. And you can, <laughs> the way you describe it, it seems like she wanted a bit more than just friendship. Um, but Dick always, again, kept her at a distance for some reason. Why did he, why did he do that? Even with personal relationships? Yeah. You, well, you know what? It's very interesting. He, um, her name, by the way, was Dieta Allman. Uh, and uh, uh, Dick and uh, another one of the officers had met Dieta and, uh, and one of her friends really right around uh, in, in late 1941. And, and, and the friendship uh, evolved. Uh, it, it wasn't a physical uh, relationship at that time. And then as, when, when Dick uh, deploys to England and certainly – uh, in the last year of the war, from uh, the Battle of the Bulge uh, to uh, Bertus Garden, she, you know, she she definitely wants more of the relationship. And Dick and Dick told me, says, "I know you want me to say those three little words, but I don't feel it." He goes, "My family." My focus are, are the soldiers of Easy Company, and he didn't want to have any distractions uh, for. Him. I read those letters. And I and I told Dick Winters. I said, uh, Dick, I have to tell you, if if I, I, I'm reading the, your responses uh, to this, I would dump you in a heartbeat. <laughs> uh, you know, on, you know, on that he goes, he goes, but you have to understand, my focus had to be on the welfare of my troops, and I did not want to have any personal distractions. That would uh, take me away from what I knew uh, had to be done. In fact, you know, you talk, you, your your article is is, is uh, excellent in the way of the monastic warrior, where you end up saying, you know, uh, Dick had the ability to leave behind the you know the maddening crowd, to de uh, develop himself completely, and to fight and lead in whatever kinds of battles he finds himself. And they may not be in combat; that might be personal battle. Uh, battles as well, and again, that's why he he had to have he had like a razor like focus on what needed to be done. Yeah, he had a mission objective in any, any moment in life, and, 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 and he understood that you know the decisions that he made would affect the uh, the lives of those soldiers. To me, there's always been something, uh, Brett. That, uh, you know, I call this a different. Um, between a leader and a commander. You know, you, you can become a leader based on the, you know, the rank that you wear or, or anything else, uh, the position that you hold. But the commander in war has to make individual uh, uh, decisions that affects the lives of individual soldiers. I, when I talk about, when I think about Dick Winters, I don't think of himself as Dick Winters the leader. I see him as Dick Winters, the commander, who is willing to go ahead and make those critical decisions that affects the lives of individual soldiers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so he didn't have too many friends during the war, not too many immediately after the war, but you were able to develop this really close friendship and bond with him. Can you tell us a little bit how that friendship developed and what it meant to you? Well, it, it, first of all, it, it, it was it was evolvement. It, it evolved from the very beginning of the uh, you know when I first started. you know what uh, you know I um, you know even from the military sense, the fact that I still remember him when he came out of the elevator at the hotel fair for that initial uh, dinner uh, when I, when he walked over there, uh, I wore I wore my uniform and and, and the fact that. Um, 
And most times I would not do that for a social uh, engagement uh, on that, but there was a mutual respect because uh, uh, we both had worn the, the uniform. And that respect in, the, in this evolving friendship transcended generations. And I think in, in war, sometimes uh, after uh, a couple generations, it will transcend uh, nationalities uh, as, as well. Uh, I always said this, from the military um, sense, we were unequal in military rank, but before we, we formed a perfect friendship because the friendship was based on trust and admiration. It was uh, a friendship free of competition or seeking advantage. But having said that, it took four, it, I'm sorry, five years before Dick felt comfortable enough to ask me to help him with his memoirs. And I guess the last thing about uh, that I would end up saying uh, this, Stephen Ambrose says this in, uh, when he's de describing the relationship between Lewis and Clark and undaunted courage. He said this, the last friendship a man makes is often the best one. Um, and I think I, I, I may not have been Dick Winter's uh, best friend. I don't think I was. I think that um, honor goes to a man by the name of Bob Hoffman. But I do know this, that I was the last friendship that he made. And I think, uh, and I think that's the thing that really kind of drew us in. It was obviously based on a mutual respect, but really common values. Uh, Dick, uh, his wife, uh, Ethel Winter, said this. She goes, she asked me about that. She says, why do you think that I allow you to come here as often to talk to Dick? I said, uh, I said, Ethel, I have nothing, uh, I don't have the slightest idea. And she said this. She said, you're the only member of Dick's friends, friends, uh, circle of friends, that who has never asked him for anything. A lot of people bring books to sign or you want this or and all this. But he goes, you never have. And I told that to Dick one time. He says, you know what? He goes, uh, and I told him before he, before he responded, I said, there's a lot of things up here in your office that I'd love to possess. Your jump boots from uh, D-Day and all this. I said, I would never ask for them. And I said, you know what? And what's more is if you offered to them, I would never take it. Because I didn't want to be uh, uh, kind of uh, beholding to him. And he said, you know what he told me? Right, he said this. Yeah, but you have something else that no one else has. And then I just smiled and I said, I know I do. <laughs> and that's his friendship. Well, well, that's to me. Uh, oh, go ahead. That's what. It, no, that, that, that's really what it was uh, based on that. Yeah. Um, if you remember in, uh, in conversations, the... Um, I, I, I would like to go there, you know, right there at the very end. Last time I saw Dick was October of uh, 2010. Uh, he died on January 2nd of uh, 2011. Last thing I said to him, uh, and I, I got very close to him, and I said this. I said, Dick, the country was blessed to have had you in its hour of need, and I will always cherish our time together. And the last thing I told him was, I love you as my brother. And his response, Brett, was simply this, don't ever change that. And that was the la those were the last words Dick Winters ever said to me. Wow, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I take great pride in that. Someone asked me, he says, well, Dick Winters, you know, he, he's, a, he's like your father. Uh, it, it was a kind of a father relationship, father-son relationship. I said, no, 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 it was a fraternal relationship. And that's what it was. Dick Winters was my brother. Wow, it's very powerful. Um, let's end on this. Um, how did, I mean, what do you think, you kind of alluded to it earlier, but what do you think Major Winters' le legacy is today? What's his lasting legacy besides... I the things that he yeah. did in over there in war, but what do you think is his big legacy? No, no, no. You know what? It wasn't the war. It wasn't the war. Uh, I, I asked him. I, I asked him direct on that. I said, what is Dick Winter's legacy to future generations? And I, and I, I phrased the question in the third person. And his answer simply was this. That's easy, and I'm going to answer it this way. It's the same that I have been saying for many years. 
hang tough. That was his favorite saying. He goes, by that, I mean simply do your best every day, whether it's school, at your job, or anywhere else. You don't have to have all the answers. There's no way you should expect that from yourself. Just satisfy yourself so at the end of the day, you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, today I did my best. If you do that, you are being honest and everything else will be okay. All right. So well, that's a great way to end. Hang tough. Well, Colonel Keenseed, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for writing the books. It's been a pleasure. Well, the pleasure's mine, Brett. It's the, uh, it, it's just, uh, you know, I take great, uh, I, I take great pride in the association with the, you know, what we call the, uh, the greatest generation. I call it the GI generation. But the um, their their legacy, not just Dick Winters, but that whole generation, uh, you know, speaks to us today in the 21st century. I agree. Thank you, Colonel Keenseed. Thank you, Brett. Take care. My guest today was Colonel Cole Keenseed. He's the author of the book Conversations with Dick Winters. Uh, you can find that on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Fantastic book. Go pick it up. Also, you can find out more uh, about Colonel King Seed's work in leadership development. He has a program called Battlefield Leadership where he and other people take corporations out and leaders out to battlefields in the U.S., Civil War battlefields, also to Normandy, and to show these leaders in the business field lessons they can take on leadership from military leaders at these very big battles. So we're talking Normandy, we're talking Gettysburg, Antietam, Alamo, all sorts of great stuff. So go check it out, battlefieldleadership.com. Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. For more manly tips and advice, make sure to check out the Art of Manliness website at artofmanliness.com. And if you enjoy the podcast, I'd really appreciate it if you give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher, help us uh, get more feedback on how to improve the show as well as get the word out about the podcast. Always appreciate your support, and until next time, this is Brett McKay telling you to stay manly. Mm -hmm.